It's time for Security Now, episode 268. Today, Steve takes on the federal government and the FBI. They're looking for back doors to all encryption so they can wiretap internet traffic. Steve explains why this is not such a good idea. Security Now is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Winamp. Subscribe to Security Now and all your favorite podcasts with the ultimate media player. Download it for free at winamp.com. Video bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. You'll find all the Twitch shows on your Roku box, Android, and Blackberry phones at all Yahoo Widget TVs powered by Mediafly. For more information, visit twit.tv slash Mediafly. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 268, recorded September 29th, 2010. Crypto Systems Backdoors. Security Now is brought to you by MailRoute. Use the anti-spam filtering Leo uses. MailRoute.info. Save 10% when you use MailRoute.info for the life of your account. It's time for security now. Ready to get uh, prepared to get uh, protected on the Internet? Let's do it. Steve Gibson is here. He is our, our host and the guy in charge at the Gibson Research Corporation, GRC.com, author of... Uh, Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility, but also the first anti-spyware. He's a big security guru, and we're so glad to have him in our fifth year of protecting you online. Hey, Steve. Actually, sixth year. It's going in. Yeah, we've completed five. Yeah. So in our we're, sixth year. Yeah. In our sixth year. Hey, Leo. Well, um, I'm a little depressed this week. What? No, Steve. Yeah, Why? I am. Why? Well, you know, I mean, I always recover from these things, but I actually had a hard time sleeping Monday night because of some news that was reported in the New York Times, which is what was so disturbing about um, the current administration's intention to submit to Congress as soon as it comes back in session after the new year, after the midterm elections, uh, under apparently pressure from the FBI to cause back doors to be uh, installed in all cryptographic communication systems on the internet so that law enforcement under court order but still um, has the ability to break the encryption well we've seen in the past how much uh, uh, government has how much regard for uh, uh, subpoenas and warrants so I, that's that's really bad news because once that's in then uh, you're 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 we, you have weak encryption and well and, well and it won't work. I mean th th that that the, the horses are out of the barn. The bad the guys will always bag. have good encryption. Yes, good encryption, perfect, bulletproof, uncrackable. It's all out there. It's all open source. Everyone knows how to do it. So what it will do is it'll create an underground of of communication systems which still cannot be cracked, which the bad guys will use. Meanwhile. Commercial products, I mean, I'm directly affected by this because of CryptoLink and my plans to do oh. a, tr a trust no one VPN. I mean, that's why I couldn't sleep Monday night. It's like, no. Oh, man. I, I mean, this is really bad. Well, we're going to talk about this. Yep. Uh, this is, a, this is of course, a, a very good subject. And, it's you know, it's not the first time this has come up. Maybe, maybe we can do something about it, too. But uh, this is a good subject for us. Yep, we're going to talk about it. Um, we do have security updates and news uh, that I think everyone's going to find interesting. A new, uh, well, first, the, the, the problem we talked about last week, the zero-day flaw, which was causing all of the ASP.NET uh, web developers to scramble around. Remember, that's the one where it was discovered being exploited that, that by probing a website and microsoft admitted that this affected millions of websites by probing a website with incorrectly encrypted replies the the way the website's error responses the error pages came back 
gave up information about the crypto, the specific crypto key that was in use, which allowed then bad guys to successfully crack, crack the crypto on those sites in order to reveal usernames and passwords and, and get into encrypted sessions. So the short-term fix was, and this was what Microsoft's formal recommendation were, was, is don't ever give any different error messages. Like consolidate all possible errors into just a simple 404, sorry, that didn't work error in order to prevent this information leakage. Well, the problem was bad enough that Microsoft did an out-of-cycle update. And Tuesday of this week, many people noted that, whoa, wait a minute, this is not the second Tuesday of the month. That was last Tuesday. and But sure enough, Microsoft said, we've got to get this thing out because it was being used in targeted attacks. So that happened, and people who are XP Service Pack 3 and later um, all received that update for all versions of Windows uh, and .NET that were affected. So that happened, and it's good. Unfortunately, we have a new zero-day vulnerability <laughs> in Windows. Just can't get away from those. That seems to be happening more and more now. And um, This is the ActiveX object which is in a DLL MSNET, MSNET obj, MSNETOBJ dot DLL. That's the, that contains the code which Microsoft uses for, with their digital rights management technology to obtain a license. And unfortunately, it's been found in the wild, again, being exploited, that that DLL contains multiple remotely exploitable vulnerabilities such that a user simply enticed into visiting a malicious web page can have arbitrary code downloaded and executed on their machine. Microsoft has acknowledged this, um, confirmed that it's a problem, but we don't have an update yet. And not, in, I mean, this just happened, so not even any time frame or, or anything. Um, it's not clear yet how widespread this is, but it was found in the wild happening. And so, you know, there's a, there's a URL, um, which it, it's a URL triggered exploit. So um, a website knows how to malform its reply to this DRM DLL um, in a way that allows it to send code to people's machines. So here's, you know, yet one more um, way in to Windows that we're learning about only because we're seeing it being actively exploited. And also just last week, we were talking about the the leakage, the confirmed leakage of from from Intel, essentially Intel's technology, which they license the HDCP um, high high definition content protection, which is used for essentially content in motion, you know, over cables and things, um, not stored on the disk. Blu-ray technology uses a different encryption, but once it's it's out there, it be essentially what Intel wanted was something that was very fast to implement in hardware so that it would give you security, but you didn't need a, a big, powerful, number-crunchy processor to do it. So they wanted to be able to like sort of quickly stream this around, and yet, as it moves across interfaces in one's like entertainment system or even inside of a computer, at no point would the content be... Could, could you find a place you could tap into it in order to get it in plain text form. Well, already there is software on the net which works. Um, the website is www.cs.sunysb.edu slash tilde rob slash hdcp.html. And from his documentation on that site, he says the HDCP cipher is designed to be efficient when implemented in hardware, but it is terribly inefficient in software, primarily because it makes extensive use of bit operations. Our implementation uses bit slicing in software to achieve high speeds by exploiting bit level parallelism. We have created a few high level routines to make it as easy as possible to implement HDCP as shown in the following example. And then, you know, the, so the source code can, for this can be downloaded. And he did some benchmarks on his software. It is able to process 
640 by 480 pixel frames using only a single core. He has a, a benchmark with a, an, a Xeon uh, 5140 running at 2.33 gigahertz, and it's able to successfully, that is all software, is able to successfully process 181 frames per second at 640 by 480 resolution. A Core 2 Duo P9600 running at 2.53 gigahertz is able to process 76 frames per second, still faster than real time, so that's fine, although it's a small frame, of course, 640 by 480. And then he says decryption of 1080p content is about seven times slower, but decryption can be parallelized across multiple cores. So a high-end 64-bit CPU should be able to decrypt 30 frames per second 1080p content using two cores and about 1.6 gig of RAM. So the fact that they're using that much RAM tells me that what he's done is he's, he's basically created a table-based system where he's using pre-computed results of, of bit twiddling in, see the, the the when he talks about the problems of doing this in software, you know we know from our you know our our series on how computers work that there are some things that that in software instructions were designed to do, but it turns out that programmers typically don't have a great need for for bit level operations. They exist, but that you can't just do you can't do many things at once. You have to sort of like test each bit individually and make decisions. Well. You, you probably want to do that all at once. So table lookup approaches is a way of getting around that. It, it, you trade the, the lack of instructions for building tables once in memory and then, and then just referencing table entries to sort of give you the result of many operations with a single, um, a, a single reference to memory. So I would imagine... That's why he needs 1.6 gig of RAM. Um, and of course, what this means is, as I also said last week, there will be hardware to do this in no time. I mean, now, you know, the, here we have a software implementation. Someone can, who's just a hobbyist can take a, um, a field programmable gate array and say, hey, I'm going to put this into hardware. It'll be fun. And um, I'm sure it'll happen. Wow. It didn't yeah. take very long. What was that, a it week? Did, yeah. And see, that's frankly... It's one of the things that I love about the net is mm -hmm. that's the way the net is. Here's some yeah. guy at, and, and what, uh, S-U-N-Y-S-B is. State University of uh, New York. New York, and yeah. I don't know where S-B is, but. Yeah, and I, I, I appreciate that this, I mean, this is the spirit of the internet. And we're going to be covering some stories here shortly, which demonstrate that, that w this is under threat, essentially, which is, I think, really too bad. Um, so, uh I've avoided drawing conclusions so far about whether the Stuxnet worm, which we've discussed on several occasions, which has been around for a long time, and, and we've talked about it because it won't go away, whether it's targeted at Iran. Um, I, the, the problem is there isn't any way to know for sure, and I'm reluctant to draw conclusions that a lot of the press, like, you know, can you say register.co.uk, uh, you know, who delight in this kind of, of spectacle are, uh, are drawing. Um, we know more than we did before, and still, it's a maybe. Maybe it's a stronger maybe than before, but Iran has disclosed that about 30,000 IP addresses within their country have been infected by Stuxnet. But, you know, that's a it's a Windows carried worm. And remember that it was found to already have in it four different zero day Windows exploits. So the developers are extremely good. The other speculation being made, which again, you know, it's all it is is speculation, is that people who have studied it are so impressed by it that they're saying this has to be state sponsored malware. Oh, that boy. is. Yeah. We've been and waiting so, for this kind of thing. But yeah. if you think about what they're attacking, it kind of makes sense. Well, yes. Um, the, the speculation, again, that's all it is, is that it's the, the um, Bush-Her nuclear reactor, 
which is right. about a few weeks to go online. Right. It's a few weeks away from going online. There are quite um, a few people, not merely Israel, but there are quite a few people who would like that not to go online. Yes, yes. So it's a big event, and the um, some uh, UPI photos, U UPI Press, posted some photos of the inside of the reactor control area that showed that it was the... Windows-based, Siemens-based <laughs> oh, PLC, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. which is precisely what this worm right. targets. Right. Um, last week, there was a, a really good uh, expert on industrial control systems, Ralph Langner, um, who published an analysis of the worm. Um, he said, and, and that this is the thing that specifically targets Siemens software systems, uh, uh, industrial control systems. Um, he suggested that it may have been used to sabotage Iran's nuclear reactor. Langner is a Siemens expert who simulated a Siemens industrial network, then analyzed the worm's attack. Um, and I'm reading from one of the online reports. It said, one of the things that Langner discovered is that when Stuxnet finally identifies its target, it makes changes to a piece of Siemens code called Organizational Block 35. I love that. It'll be the name of a movie one of these days. OB-35. OB-35. This Siemens component monitors critical factory operations, things that need a response within 100 milliseconds. By messing with operational block 35, Stuxnet could easily cause a refinery's centrifuge to malfunction, but it could be used to hit other targets as well. Um, and this is this is somebody else quoting. Said the only thing I can say is that it's something designed to go bang. Whoever created Stuxnet was um, also employed for previously unknown zero-day attacks and a peer-to-peer -peer communication system. Um, compromised digital certificates, as we know, belonging to Real Tech Semiconductor and J Micron Technology. We talked about how coincidentally, or maybe not, they were in the same office park. Um, and displayed extensive knowledge of industrial systems. Still reading, this is not something that your run-of-the-mill hacker can pull off. Many security researchers think that it would take the resources of a nation-state to accomplish this. Uh-huh. So, again, speculation. I've avoided it until now, but with, you know, I, I thought... We have to talk about it. Um, and Can I so say this is better than a bomb? This doesn't kill anybody. And if it takes the plant offline, yay. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we, we, we uh, yeah. Potentially, yeah. Yeah, I mean, come on. Yeah, I mean, the, the expectation is this is not for energy generation. This is for, right. you know, it, bomb it, making, fuel enrichment. enrichment. Yeah. Yes. Now, we yes. don't know. And if, if it's just a power plant, that's a shame. But uh, this, everybody seems to agree that that's not what's going on. Uh, unfortunately, well, unfortunately or fortunately, this probably isn't a long-term uh, hack, right? I mean, this right. is, just a, this is just a road bump. The jig is up now. I mean, the, you know, organizational block 35 will be protected. Um, they will make, uh, make sure. I mean, Iran said this thing did not get into the reactor. It's crawling around all over outside, but it didn't get in. So, I mean, if that was its intent, we just, again, um, you know, it got in many other places that had organizational block 35 altered also. So, you know, we, again, it's just, you can't say that was, you, no one knows that was the target, but, um, it qualifies and it's certainly high profile, yeah. which is really the only reason it all comes up. And Dr. Mom and some others in the chat room are saying, well, you know, this could have, I mean, if it had caused a meltdown, could have had horrendous, mm. disastrous impact, worse than bombing it, maybe. Yeah. So I shouldn't say it's better than bombing. <sighs> Speaking of which, um, rapidly making its way through the Senate is a, a bill which many people are upset about. It's called the Combating Online Infringements and Counterfeits Act. Mm, don't get me started. I know. C-O-I-C-A. People who want to read about it can look. Uh, e the EFF.org site has it. Um, and um, the URL that I have here in front of me is wrong. But it's just www.eff.org slash C-O-I-C-A, which has a bunch of resources. Here's the deal. 
um, and this is why people are so upset. It is a law which, if passed, and it's in the process of being passed, apparently, or, or getting ready to be, making its way through the Senate, is the quote. Um, it creates two new U.S. Attorney General controlled DNS blacklists. For the first, it's the first time we've ever had anything like that in the U.S., um, which would be required by law to be enforced by ISPs and domain registrars. There's two, the, the, there's re, the reason there's two lists, one, you have to follow, the second, you are strongly encouraged to follow, but it isn't, it isn't, you're not breaking the law as an ISP or a regist or domain registrar if you don't. So what we're talking about doing is, for the first time ever, empowering the U.S. Attorney General to censor the Internet for everyone in the U.S. So that domains that exist, we would not be able to find. We would put them in, and they we're not, it's not even clear what we would get. A, a redirect or a 404 page doesn't exist error. It's not clear what would happen. But um, citizens of the United States would be unable to go to pages, domains, that were on this list. And as, as you can imagine, I mean, this is a dramatic change. This is all of the Internet no longer being available. And, and you know, I, I was just, as I was putting this report together and, for example, had that page um, uh, showing the HDCP software decryption, I mean, we're, you know, this is the freedom that the Internet has created and we're talking about maybe, you know, sites like RapidShare and, and you know, quasi-legitimate sites that somebody somewhere decides, you know, that this is no doubt driven by the MPAA, our Motion Picture uh, Association, uh, you know, another... Oh, yeah, and RIAA another, and all those... Exactly. Yeah. Um, and they're just saying, oh, yeah, we, you know, we need a way to take these sites down. The problem is there are already legal means for dealing with this kind of of you know online technology you know online content that people want to bring down there are processes for you know allowing our legal system to go and do takedowns that's what's wrong um, with this it kind of bypasses due process that's what yes, in my I mean, opinion is wrong with it yes exactly and it and and you can imagine over time it'll get easier to put sites on this list. It'll be like, wow, this works really well. Right. Let's expand this a well, little bit. As the EFS has pointed out, the, every new technology has been fought as copyright violations by rights holders, including VCRs, yep. player we pianos. <laughs> we wouldn't have them if this, if this law had been in effect in 1920. So uh, th what one thing we know for sure is people who own rights today are not the best people to ask when it comes to what the future is going to look like. And yeah. giving them this kind of power is, uh, is just a bad idea. Not, not, you know, it's not like uh, you and I are pro-piracy. It's Absolutely. Not, not of course not. I mean, you know, I'm a publisher of intellectual property. Right. I, I make my entire living on, on the fact that people honor my copyrights. And, you know, I respect their purchases. I don't do anything to keep them from copying the product. I just hope they won't. I, well, intelligent, know? and this is funny. I think really this is where education is going to help. Uh, there is still this stupid notion, and we're going to, it also applies to the back doors that we're going to talk about later oh, in the yeah. show, that this kind of stuff hurts bad guys. It doesn't. Bad guys get around this stuff routinely. Yep. It only it only impinges on honest people. That's what's well, and, really crazy about this. And Leo, stuff. this isn't what the country this isn't what the United States has no. stood for for you know since no. its founding no. since since it was founded. No. I mean it's just it's a shame. I, you know, the idea that we would be in a country that doesn't let us go to some domains where people outside the U.S. I mean, we invented the Internet. Right. The people outside the U.S. are able, with their DNS servers, to get to sites here that we can't. And again, and this, this it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it does seem to happen without due process. Yes. And it, uh, it will not work. That's the other well, thing. Yeah. There, are, there will be ways yeah. around Pirates it. Pirates I mean, will get around it, of course. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I would immediately do something to get around it if it weren't illegal to do it. And I'm sure it would be. So I'm, I'm prescribed from doing that. So but guess who gets around it? Crooks. Yeah. And honest people who obey the law are the ones who are hurt by this.
Well, and you end up with cat and mouse, too. You end up with those, you know, sites that are blacklisted, register uh, under a different name. And for a while, they're there until the blacklist catches up with them, and then they move again. I mean, it's it, the whole thing is just brain dead. Yeah. It, it makes no sense. But we have a problem, and that is that we, we're dealing with technology that the legislatures probably don't understand. Um, and and who knows what the unintended consequences are going to be. But the idea that we're facing state-sponsored censorship of the Internet... Uh, Welcome it to does, China, folks. It, exactly. It does give us pause. And unfortunately, it's driven by commercial interests. Of course. I mean, that's what's behind this, is commercial interests. Not in the public interest. No. All right. I saw somewhere, and I couldn't find it again. I just wanted to mention this because we've talked about it a couple times. The, the judgment came down about the school district that was spying on students who took school laptop property home, whose, administers had, who, whose administrators had installed some webcam-based technology. Remember that right. um, some parents were suing the the school because their son or daughter were being spied on and one of the teachers confronted them with a photo of them in their eating like, candy eating candy in their bedroom saying that th this is not conduct becoming You're popping uh, pills. Students. It's pills. anyway this the charges were dropped oh, against no. the district saying what? that there was no malicious intent oh so the uh the the prosecution was unsuccessful. Wow, that's kind of stunning. Yeah, I know. I I saw it. And I just thought, oh well, you know, who knows? Somebody had a good defense attorney and uh, and managed to get these people off. So it's tough to sue government agencies. In many cases, it's illegal, or you know, you can't. Yeah, uh, and I think judges uh, almost always are going to uh, uh, err on the side of caution there. So yeah, he, I yeah, guess I, the, I guess the judge deemed the no criminal activity you know occurred right well and i hope that it, th this got a lot of press and i hope that lessons were learned even if exactly you know, i think that's no, the case yes i it's hard to imagine that lessons were not learned so i don't think there's many schools will do that again no it is it really did get a lot of noise so that that's good um i have no errata and just a short little uh spin right note from a, a happy user because we have got a lot of content to cover. Uh, it was just an email we received with a subject of testimonial. And uh, Bill Pomeroy wrote, he says, I've owned a copy of Spinrite 6.0 and its earlier cousins since their birth. So 20 years. Fortunately, I haven't had to rescue any of my hard drives during all that time until yesterday. Spinrite was just one of those must-have programs that I kept at hand. Yesterday, WinXP SP2, oh, good for you, Bill, you're still where I am, um, on boot would only blue screen. Check disk slash F and slash R produced only more blue screens. I inserted my bootable SR 6.0 CD, and after completing a level two procedure, I was back in business. I don't know how much I've spent on Spinrite over the years, but whatever it was, yesterday made it all worthwhile. That's Thank so you, Spinrite. That is a nice story. Neat story. We are going to talk about backdoors in crypto systems and why yep. the federal government is going after it. Yep. Once it's not the first time, uh, and I suppose it won't be the last time, but this is one uh, we want everybody who's listening, who understands the issues, and that's the key, to listen, to understand it better, and then go fight this. But we'll talk about it in just a second. It's just this is just. Uh, Oh, I'm so glad you're covering this, Steve. I, this, I want to talk about today uh, a, a little commercial for a friend of mine. I don't usually do this, but Tom Johnson I've known for six or seven years. I met him uh, at a family camp. Where the whole family was there. And he was spending a lot of the time in the family camp programming in his, <laughs> in his cabin. And we got to talking. He was a geek. And uh, he's actually got a great, uh, he's got a great uh, pedigree. He wrote, I don't know, you remember Front Bridge? Does that ring a bell? Uh, mm -hmm. It was an email processing uh, gateway service uh, that he created, one of the very first software as a service or cloud applications in the world, and he sold it to Microsoft in 2005. It's, Microsoft, it's now called Microsoft Exchange Hosted Services. So this guy knows his stuff. Wow. We, yeah. He, he worked with John Postel at USC. I mean, he's a really smart 
guy. And for the last six years, he has been blocking spam from my mailbox with his company, MailRoute. I've always wanted to do an ad for MailRoute because I've been so happy with him. And he finally said, all right, all right. <laughs> now, this isn't, um, and, you know, people have anti-spam software on their machine. This is not that. Uh, if you're using Gmail, a lot of people are. This is, you know, you already have anti-spam. This is not for you. This is for a small business that wants to run its own mail servers. Um, I run leoville.com. That's what runs through MailRoute. Um, K, K Shep, Ken Shepardson has his own um, domain that he runs. And it's for people like that, people who have their own domains. They want really high-quality spam filtering on the domain. And, uh, and it's very affordable. But what I really like about it is it's very effective. Basically, no false positives. Tom is, you know, Tom is so serious about that. And that's a real problem in spam filtering where you, you know, you're, you're, you can get rid of the junk, but what if you get rid of the good stuff? That's a real problem in business. Let me just tell you, I've been using this for six years. I asked Tom to send me my stats. In the last year, I was sent 3.7 million email messages in the last year. Of those, 3.6 million were spam oh and were blocked at, at, the, at all the Leoville addresses. That's 96.5% spam. It's actually going up. Last month, 96.8% uh, spam. These are messages that don't go to my server. They never, I never see them. This is a huge amount of traffic that my server doesn't have to handle. Now, this is the reason this is, this is something you need access to your DNS records for your server. Uh, if you're a business, you'll have that. If you, if you run your own servers, you'll have that. You need to change the MX record. So what happens is my MX record in my DNS goes to MailRoute. He sanitizes it, sends the mail back to me directly to mail.leoville.com. It is, I can't, when, when it, <laughs> I accidentally changed the MX record a couple of years ago, boy, did I notice the difference. It is amazing. It also makes you more secure because as you know, Steve, uh, it's not just spam, it's phishing uh, attempts. Yep. They get rid of all the phishing emails, the viruses are filtered out, so there's no attached viruses. Um, directories harvest and denial of service attacks are thwarted at the perimeter outside your network. And you, it saves you money, in effect, because you're in, they do all the infrastructure, they do all the support, they handle all this garbage so your servers don't have to. And they have never, ever... Oh, another thing, if my mail server goes down, which it does from time to time, they just store it, they hold on to it, and they send it along, and he's got a very smart... You would love this guy. I want. Sometime we'll sit down and talk with Tom. He's down your way. I think oh. he's, in, uh, he's in Huntington Beach or somewhere. But he, uh, for instance... They are, I think, the only spam service that uses gray listing. You know what gray listing is? It's very clever. It, it, the first time you see an email from a certain address, it says, come back later. Ah, uh, right. Now, m most mail servers will, will drop it. Well, no, they'll send it again. If it's a normal mail server, right. they'll say, oh, yeah, because it says it's basically a busy signal. Busy, come, can, you know, our server's overload. Can you come back in a minute? Right. And most mail servers, SMTP servers, will say, no problem. They come back in a minute or five minutes or ten minutes. Spam, of course, they're using they, zombies and stuff. They don't try again. They, they just move, move on. on. Yep. So gray listing by itself gets rid of a ton of stuff. Now, once it's seen an IP address, once it says, oh, this is a good address, you don't get gray listed again. It's just the first time mail comes from that IP address to your system. It's things like this that are just, I mean, this guy lives and breathes this stuff, and he's so great, and it's very affordable. Um, uh, service starts at $10 per, I'm sorry, $2 per user per month, and the more users, the less it costs. Um, I'll tell you what, we're going to give you a 10% off for the life of your account, there is no contract. It's month to month. So there's, you know, they, this guy is so confident that you will use his service that he doesn't make you sign for a, a long-term thing. This is just so great. Outbound services, too, if you're tired of getting blacklisted, they handle it all for you. All you got to do is go to mailroute.info. It's a special address we've set up for Twit listeners. Mailroute.info. There's no coupon code needed or anything. Uh, you can sign up online. You change your MX record within three minutes. I mean, it's, it's instant. You're done. And I'll be honest, I don't look at the spam store very often because I don't need to. It's just, it's so effective. MailRoute.info. You need to have access to your MX record. So it's for small businesses who want to, you know, do their own mail. It's not for, if you're not, not if you're using Gmail. Although I use, G, I use it with Gmail because I have Leoville mail go to Gmail. 
Um, I, you're just going to love it. They say, we're not going to force you to stay because we know you won't want to leave. <laughs> this is the kind of company that Steve and I kind of really identify with. You know, a guy who's just like lives and breathes this stuff, has written the best thing in the world. It is not the same. Grain listing is not black holing. I got to tell you, Pugsby says, oh, it's the same as black hole. Nope. And by the way, black holes are not a problem on this, you know, orbs and maps and stuff. They use it, but they use it in an intelligent way. So I have never lost important mail ever. Mailroute.info. Give it a try. And uh, I, I have a feeling you will be very happy. And say hi to Tom when you call him because he's a, he's a really great guy. Mailroute.info. We want to welcome them to the uh, Twit family of sponsors. All right, Steve. <sighs> Take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, let me start by reading a quote from the then director of the FBI, uh, Louis Free, back in 1997, who was speaking before a Senate Judiciary Committee and said, For law enforcement, framing the issue is simple. In this time of dazzling telecommunications and computer technology, where information can have extraordinary value, the ready availability of robust encryption is essential. No one in law enforcement disputes that. Clearly, in today's world, and more so in the future, the ability to encrypt both contemporaneous communications and stored data is a vital component of information security. As is so often the case, however, there is another aspect to the encryption issue that, if left unaddressed, will have severe public safety and national security ramifications. Law enforcement is in unanimous agreement that the widespread use of robust non-key recovery encryption ultimately will devastate our ability to fight crime and prevent terrorism. Uncrackable encryption will allow drug lords, spies, terrorists, and even violent gangs to communicate about their crimes and their conspiracies with impunity. We will lose one of the few remaining vulnerabilities of the worst criminals and terrorists upon which law enforcement depends to successfully investigate and often prevent the worst crimes. For this reason, the law enforcement community is unanimous in calling for a balanced solution to this problem. So yeah. that was 13 years ago. Oh, really? Oh, 13 years wow. ago, 1997. What happened on Monday was that Charlie Savage, who reports for the New York Times, wrote a story whose headline was U.S. wants to make it easier to wiretap the Internet. And I'm going to read this. Federal law enforcement and national security officials are preparing to seek sweeping new regulations for the Internet, arguing that their ability to wiretap criminal and terrorism suspects is, quote, going dark, unquote, as people increasingly communicate online instead of by telephone. Because, of course, they've got the telephone wiretapped already. Essentially, officials want Congress to require... All services that enable communications, including encrypted email transmitters like BlackBerry, social networking websites like Facebook, and software that allows direct peer-to-peer -peer messaging like Skype to be technically capable of complying if served with a wiretap order. The mandate would include being able to intercept and unscramble encrypted messages. The bill, which the Obama administration plans to submit to lawmakers next year, raises fresh questions about how to balance security needs and protecting privacy and fostering innovation. And because security services around the world face the same problem, it could set an example that is copied globally. James X. Dempsey, Vice President for the Center of Democracy and Technology and Internet Policy Group, said the proposal had huge implications and challenged fundamental elements of the Internet revolution, including its decentralized design. Quote, they really are asking for the authority to redesign services that take advantage of the unique and now pervasive architecture of the Internet, he said. 
They basically want to turn back the clock and make Internet services function the way the telephone system used to function. But law enforcement officials contend that imposing such a mandate is reasonable and necessary to prevent the erosion of their investigative powers. Quote, we're talking about lawfully authorized intercepts, said Valerie E. Caproni, general counsel for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We're not talking expanding authority. We're talking about preserving our ability to execute our existing authority in order to protect the public safety and national security, unquote. Investigators have been concerned for years that changing communications technologies could damage their ability to conduct surveillance. In recent months, officials from the FBI, the Justice Department, the National Security Agency, the White House, and other agencies have been meeting to develop a proposed solution. There is not yet agreement on some important elements, like how to word statutory language defining who counts as a communications service provider, according to several officials familiar with the deliberations. But they want it to apply broadly, including to companies that operate from servers abroad, like Research in Motion, the Canadian maker of BlackBerry devices. In recent months, that company has come into conflict with the governments of Dubai and India over their inability to conduct surveillance of messages sent via BlackBerry's encrypted service. In the United States, phone and broadband networks are already required to have interception capabilities under a 1994 law called the Communications Assistance and Law Enforcement Act, C-A-L-E-A. -E it aimed to ensure that government surveillance abilities would remain intact during the evolution from a copper wire phone system to digital networks and cell phones. Often, investigators can intercept communications at a switch operated by the network company, but sometimes, like when a target uses a service that encrypts messages between his computer and its servers, they must instead serve the, serve the order on a service provider to get an unscrambled version. Like phone companies, communication service providers are subject to wiretap orders. But the 1994 law does not apply to them. While some maintain interception capacities, others wait until they're served with orders to try to develop them. The FBI's Operational Technologies Division spent $9.75 million last year helping communication companies including some subject to the 1994 law that had difficulties do so. And its 2010 budget included $9 million for a, quote, going dark program to bolster its electronic surveillance capabilities. Beyond such costs, Ms. Capone said, the FBI efforts to help retrofit services have a major shortcoming. The process can delay their ability to wiretap a subject for months. Moreover, some services encrypt messages between users so that even the provider cannot unscramble them. There's no public data about how often court-approved surveillance is frustrated because of a service's technical design. But as an example, one official said an investigation into a drug cartel earlier this year was stymied because smugglers used peer-to-peer -peer software, which is difficult to intercept because it is not routed through a central hub. Agents eventually installed surveillance equipment in a suspect's office, but that tactic was, quote, risky, unquote, the official said, and the delay, quote, prevented the interception of pertinent communications. Moreover, according to several other officials, after the failed Times Square bombing last May, investigators discovered that the suspect, Faisal Shahzad, had been communicating with a service that lacked pre-built interception capability. If he had aroused suspicion beforehand, there would have been a delay before he could have been wiretapped. To counter such problems, officials are coalescing around several of the proposal's likely requirements. One, communication services that encrypt messages must have a way to unencrypt them. Two, Foreign-based providers that do business inside the United States must install a domestic office capable of performing intercepts. And three, 
developers of software that enables peer-to-peer -peer communication must redesign their service to allow interception. Providers that failed to comply would face fines or some other penalty, but the proposal is likely to direct companies to come up with their own way to meet the mandates. Writing any statute in technically neutral terms would also help prevent it from becoming obsolete, officials said, they want, which means to say make it broad. Even with such a law, some gaps could remain. It is not clear how it could compel compliance by overseas services that do no domestic business or from a freeware application developed by volunteers. In their battle with research in motion, company, countries like Dubai, Dubai have sought leverage by threatening to block back BlackBerry data from their networks. But Ms. Capone said the FBI did not support filtering the Internet in the United States. Still, even a proposal that consists only of a legal mandate is likely to be controversial, said Michael Sussman, a former Justice D Department lawyer who advises communications providers. Quote, it would be an enormous change for newly covered companies, he said. Implementation would be a huge technology and security headache, and the investigative burden will cost, and cost would shift to providers. Several privacy and technology advocates argued that requiring interception capabilities would create holes that would inevitably be exploited by hackers. Stephen Bellavan, a Columbia University computer science professor, pointed to an episode in Greece five years ago in 2005. It was discovered that hackers had taken advantage of a legally mandated wiretap function to spy on top officials' phones, including the prime minister's. It's a disaster waiting to happen, he said. If they start building in all these back doors, they will be exploited. Susan Landau, a Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Study fellow and former Sun Microsystems engineer, argued that the proposal would raise costly impediments to innovation by small startups. Every engineer... Like you. Yeah, like me. Every engineer who's developing the wiretap system is an engineer who's not building in greater security, more features, or getting the product out faster, she says. Moreover, providers of services featuring user-to-user -user encryption are likely to object to watering it down. Oh, gee, you think? <laughs> Similarly, in the late 1990s, encryption makers fought off a proposal to require them to include a backdoor enabling wiretapping, arguing it would cripple their products in the global market. But law enforcement officials rejected such arguments. They said including an interception capability from the start was less likely to inadvertently create security holes than retrofitting it after receiving a wiretap order. They also noted that critics predicted that the 1994 law would impede cell phone innovation, but the technology continued to improve, and their envisioned decryption mandate is modest, they contended, because service providers, not the government, would hold the key. Quote, as the final line, no one should be promising their customers that they will thumb their nose at a U.S. court order, Ms. Capone said. They can promise strong encryption. They just need to figure out how they can provide us plain text. Yeah. <laughs> That's called a paradox. So. <laughs> An oxymoron. Here's the problem. First of all, I, I, I mean, we can all sympathize with the with law enforcement's dilemma because everything that lewis free said 13 years ago is coming to and has come to pass um skype's encryption is very good they did it right um and we, how many times have we talked about the fact that encryption technology today is done i mean right. it's bulletproof you we have reindahl running with a 256-bit uh, key that is a simple mathematical algorithm, and we have no means, none, for cracking it. It is uncrackable. Now, the, the, the problem is, and we said this a little bit at the top of the show, is the, this is too late. I mean, I completely sympathize with, with what law enforcement wants to do, with the dilemma they have. But this technology exists. It is 
in the public domain. It is in open source tools all over the world. It's it's already escaped and and there's nothing they can do about it. And so, you know, here I am looking at my next product, CryptoLink, that I've talked about often, which I've, I mean, I have a design is, is laid out. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about it because we'll talk about what it means to put a back door in something like this. But, but now one of my, the things I was proudest about is that CryptoLink would have a, a open protocol I mean, I, I, I'm, the, the, the code itself is going to be mine, closed, but the protocol that it implements is going to be published and open and subject to peer review. I want that so that, you know, guys who, who have a, a more of an attack mentality than, a, you know, the guy who invented it here mentality can look at it and say, this really looks good. There's, I mean, it's so simple. And it's like, yes, I know, it's really simple. And the simpler it is, the, the more easy it is to know that it's secure. And so, so, so what does this mean? Does this mean that, that the FBI would capture data on the wire, which they cannot read because it's encrypted, and then, I guess, get a court order and then bring the data to me with the court order and say... The law says you must decrypt this for us, this which your product encrypted. Well, okay, that's so not so bad because then you would have the keys, not them. Correct. And that's one, one of the notes that was in the article that uh, Charlie published says that the individuals would have the keys. So, so I'm assuming that that's the case. Now, of course, this creates a vulnerability because... I could be compelled to decrypt something not only by court order, but at the point of a gun. By a bad guy. Exactly. If something is, in, is sufficiently valuable, right. this, now I'm exposed. And I didn't want that. I mean, the, I was so jazzed that, that, that CryptoLink would be like my ultimate expression of TNO. Trust no one. Right. Not even me. I mean, I, I, that, that an individual could rekey their copy of CryptoLink anytime they wanted. And, you know, if for, for, at any time, just, you know, if, for whatever reason, and sort of start fresh. And no one would have any knowledge of what their key was. Um, but this is now, how is this different than um, maybe putting the keys in the hand of the user... And then the, the court order or the police go to the user and say, well, you've got to give up your keys. Then that right. leaves you out of it. It leaves me out of it. Um, the problem is that, now, and see, that's just it, is I'm, I was assuming that that scenario I just painted is the way it would work. But right. it's sounding like maybe the FBI wants real-time monitoring. I mean, maybe they... That's what they, they need, right? They need a hole that they can open and leave open. And they're comparing it to the phone system where they're able right. to tap somebody's phone. So now they're saying we want to be able to tap somebody's computer. Exactly. And any any dialogue back and forth, and I mean, they single out peer-to-peer -peer talking about, you know, Skype. And, you know, as we know, Skype is a point-to-point -point technology. The, the central server is used for presence establishment so that you can see your Skype contacts that are online. But the, the Skype technology is beautifully designed so that there so that it's a point-to-point -point encryption. So if the FBI is saying that Skype needs to be able Skype corporate needs to be able to give them act you know wiretapping class access to Skype communications. Well, that absolutely requires a redesign. Right. That's like, okay, now that means the infra, all of Skype's communications has to go through a central location where it is decrypted or could be and, and made available so that it's no longer point to point. I mean, if that's what it takes, if that's what this law says, I won't ever write CryptoLink. I, you know, I mean, that's not what I want to do. I want a point-to-point -point 
VPN-ish like product. I mean, the, the, this legislation is threatening that. It says, as I understand it, that, that there will be a law if this horrible thing should pass, which will require wiretap class access to encrypt to all encrypted commercial products and software and services. Now, uh, and again, the, all that does is it creates an underground of, of, of TNO technology that, you know, I have no interest in developing for bad guys. I certainly would never do that. And, and, I, and I would hate to think that, that my crypto system would be used by terrorists. But, I mean, that's a, that's a problem that technology always creates. Is that, it's, you know, it's not, technology is neither good or bad. It's a capability, and it's the application of it, which, is, which then requires, you know, morality and ethics and, and responsibility. It's always been the case. That's, that's what technology is. So, uh, so what do you think? <laughs> well, if they're saying in the chat room, and this is this is quite apt, that there's law enforcement can always propose things that would make their life easier. Random door-to-door -door searches would make it easier to enforce laws. So that has never been the sole criterion in the U.S. anyway for our laws. That's why we have a constitution. The constitution protects us against random door-to-door -door searches, very specifically. Um, the interesting issue is there is no right, some say, a right to privacy in the U.S. Constitution. So that's one issue, is uh, there isn't any specific prohibition. Of course, the founders didn't really consider encryption <laughs> when they wrote the Constitution. So I guess the question is, you know, um, how far is too far for law enforcement to push it? Well, and we there's a precedent established already um, with that... Uh, uh, Kalia Act, where we know that given a court order, our law enforcement is able to tap our phones. Right. They're able to tap phones and cell phones, which is de and what cell phone uses an encrypted technology, which is decrypted for them. Mm -hmm. So they're able to tap them. Now, I mean, the the one of the problems is this that raises all kinds of interesting practical problems, because how does the FBI know? I mean, encrypted communications, as we've often discussed, is pseudo-random noise. How does the FBI know... What to listen if, to. What, yeah, what software is on a machine? Right. I've done a lot of research over the last couple of days, l listening to what everybody is saying about this. As you can imagine, this is a huge kerfuffle. I mean, there's people blogging. Their, you know, their <laughs> fingers are smoking. They're, they're, they're blogging so fast. I mean, there was more than a thousand articles... I did a, a, a search on Google News, a thousand articles about that were launched since Monday when this New York Times article came out and, um, and, and bloggers going crazy. So um, some of the people have said that, the, that law enforcement does have a means to solve the problem. And that's by uh, um, by getting to the endpoints. That is, if they want to monitor someone's computer, they have a means. Go to the person. Yes, to put some spyware, some legally mandated spyware, and there is such stuff. The FBI has their own spyware, which you know, like a keystroke logger, and 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 that ilk, which they can and do currently install surreptitiously in people's machines who are who after they get a court order to do so which puts them under surveillance and feeds everything they're doing out the same internet connection to the fbi so the person doesn't know so so essentially what the fbi is doing is they're getting all of that before it's encrypted by this suite of now existing crypto based products I mean, you know, if if mine, if CryptoLink were sitting there on the system and somebody were using it, all you see, I mean, CryptoLink's data doesn't identify itself. Maybe that's going to be a requirement of the law that 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 this that encrypted data have beacons in it, uh, tags. Uh, oh, no, I mean, think about of it. Of course, too. they need to. 
Yes, somehow they would have to be able to say, oh, you know, what programs, what software is, it has turned, has created this pseudo random noise. So there have to be little markers every so often in the data stream that identified what, what software and version and so forth this was only for the purpose, because I wasn't going to put it in otherwise, only for the purpose of making it identifiable to some, to a third party, presumably law enforcement, and we hope law enforcement. The other problem is it does then begin, I mean, even that starts to crumble privacy because then anybody can be looking at the communications mm -hmm. and see what tools you're using. Mm -hmm. If the FBI can determine it, so can anybody else. So now there's information disclosure when before all I was sending was pseudo random noise, not not anymore. I and everybody else, if that's if that's what we have to do, I mean. So it's and if we're talking about having like having to rearchitect the products as it, as was described, such that point to point communications can no longer be point to point. That is, the FBI wants real-time wiretap monitoring of the same class they have with the phone system. Well, now you can't do a VPN. It's illegal to have an encrypted connection between two points, is what this says. Is that the law will require somehow that something sends a copy somewhere else or stores it or makes it available somehow. I mean, th this is hugely sweeping from an architectural standpoint well i just uh, you know i hope uh and and by the way this is not the first time they've tried to do this and in the past it has been uh prevented so uh, i hope that uh, cooler heads will prevail here I well think law enforcement acts as if it has the right to wiretap and that if technology comes along and makes that impossible that they have no other means uh for enforcement and I find that just difficult to believe. And, I, and we've got to underscore the fact, which you said at the very beginning, that this doesn't prevent people from using strong encryption. It, it, bad guys will still have access to strong encryption. Yes. That cannot and, be and broken. That's what they'll use. And they'll it, just use be, it. Yes. Exactly. And so, it's, it's, so here's, this, here's this law, which is potentially would hugely inconvenience I mean, to the, to the point where I won't create such a product. I mean, I just, I won't do and it. to I'll, no I'll, purpose because it, precisely it huge, nothing. Huge inconvenience, and the bad guys will still use the free open source tools, which already exist. There's already, you know, audio communications clients point to point that are, that, that are, that are free that you can use that are well encrypted because it's so easy to do. So... So it doesn't solve the problem. It just it creates a you know. So what do you, you you catch the dumb criminals who use, you know the the commercial software. But you know everyone will know now that back doors are installed in all of this stuff. So so the bad guys will find the stuff that doesn't have back doors in it. I mean it just it it, it boggles my mind. And then I'm wondering, wait a minute, what about outside the country? Because we have had in the past, an inside-outside-the-country situation. You'll remember, Leo, that the very first version of Netscape Navigator had a 40-bit encryption and a 128-bit encryption. The 128-bit encryption was much stronger than the 40-bit, but encryption back then was classified by right. this country munitions. It was munitions. As a, it was a munition. And, and that, so, look how well that worked. Uh huh. So you were unable to export it from the country because it was a munition. So Netscape created a watered down 40 bit key for their SSL. And as we remember, they invented SSL um, to, to create strongly encrypted connections. And that was the exportable version. So the U.S. would allow Netscape Navigator to be downloaded by anybody in 40-bit version. The problem was what we all wanted, even us in the U.S., was the 128-bit version, and we couldn't get it. You had to go through all, jump through all kinds of hoops to, to get the strong one 
proving where, who you were and where you lived and, 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 the, and you weren't ever going to let it go and weren't going to send it to anybody and so forth, such that nobody used it. We all oh. used the 40-bit one, which took about a week to crack back then and just sort of held our breath and it's like the best, it's all we could get. So that's what we used. And so there was this notion of inside the country, outside the country. Well, so could I create CryptoLink in the in the TNO fashion that I want to for sale outside the country and and then have like, you know, the backdoor spying version. <laughs> this is why I couldn't sleep Monday night. I was so upset by this. It was like, oh, I mean, I, I just, uh, well, I guess we can hope and certainly do that uh, this just won't happen. That, that uh, enough people will explain to our legislators that there are, I mean, I, it's, the more I think about it, the more I think of technical hurdles and right. technical problems. Right. And again, it's, it's, I, I would like the FBI to have the tools that they need, but the technology to escape surveillance exists. The technology is out there. It's free. Every, it's algorithms. It's math. It exists. It's done. And so... With unfortunately, as communications does move more to the internet, and and you know the internet is going to go dark in their jargon um, as we encrypt. I mean, how many times have you and I talked about wishing everything was encrypted? Right. You know, like you know, force HTTPS. We talked about a few weeks ago. You know, and websites forcing SSL. I mean, we see this as a good thing because we're we're good guys who don't want to be spied on when we're at Starbucks and open Wi-Fi locations. And and I'd love to create a, a super robust, absolutely killer VPN to offer this kind of technology, which again, it exists. It's just math. Offer it to people. And that's under threat now. It just reminds me so much of the uh, discussion of copy protection, of DRM. Um, it's and it, it, you know it, it it seems like in this case the 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 uh, motion picture industry the recording industry is kind of hand in hand with law enforcement in the sense that they would like to use technical tools to prevent something they don't like the problem being that DRM doesn't work because it only he hinders honest people and crooks just go right around it and so DRM solutions are ineffective and it's been proven they're ineffective they just don't yes. work. And yes. I think that this is this is analogous. It's not exactly the same, obviously, but it's analogous. Once once uh, you know, uh, it's possible to get around this stuff. The bad guys will. Now, I've I've talked to law enforcement people, and they say, "Oh, you'd be surprised how dumb crooks are." And so their point of view is, "Yeah, I mean, we, a, a smart crook can evade wiretapping as well, um, but most crooks aren't smart, so we mm -hmm. get them." So their point of view is, "No, we just want to have a back door because most." crooks won't be smart enough to use pgp or some some truly encrypted solution they'll just use oh hey skype works and so so here's the problem is that what they want to do it sounds like could fundamentally force architectural changes on existing services like Skype is a perfect example yeah. because, you know, we, you and I are talking over it right now. We have an encrypted connection right. directly between the two of us. Nobody can decrypt it. No man in the middle can intercept this dialogue you and I are having right. um, and, and block it. And this was, uh, this was negotiated when we connected and Skype Central was not involved. Now, if, if the, a law is created that requires that even with a court order that that um somehow this conversation can be overheard v over the internet then that's that it changes the architecture of 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 the Skype product and and I see that as a huge issue a huge problem so now what I you know both of our Skypes feed a stream to a third party which we assume no one is listening to most of the time, but we now know somebody might be if if they have the legal right to do so. I mean, again, I have no problem with that. I, I, the, the problem I have is that this isn't easy to do. I mean, it isn't, uh, you know, DRM, I would argue, 
for example, is maybe less onerous because although you know people chafe at the idea that they can't make personal copies and and so forth, but it's you know basically you put the di you put the DVD in your player and you press play and it right, plays right and it it plays just as well if it's copy protected and, and and if it's not here we're I mean we're talking about um, fundamental requirements that, that that change the way stuff works um, and that wouldn't be effective anyway right. oh. <laughs> that's I guess that's the big one isn't it. <laughs> It wouldn't be effective anyway. Yeah, yeah. Now I do take issue with the credit with the critics saying because I want you know in, in full honesty here with the critics saying this weakens some of these technologies. Um, it the fact is, for example, if I mean I've already I've 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 designed I designed Monday evening as I was recovering from this news, it's like, okay, what am I going to do about this? It's like, you know, I mean, and I posted uh, my original posting to my news group as well. It's over. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to do crypto link. I, I, I will not do this. And, and then I thought, well, you know, and then some people said, Oh, Steve, but we want it. And we know we, we trust you. And, and, and if, it, if you were forced to have to reveal our communication with the corridor, then fine. You know, don't give up on something that's going to be so cool and offer so many unique features, blah, blah, blah. And so I thought, well, okay, <laughs> maybe. Um, I mean, again, if I have to, if there's no way that I'm going to be like involved in every dialogue with every crypto link customer that is, you know, no, running no, their traffic through no, my no, server. No, that will no, never no, happen. No, 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 no. Well, you, you know, if people, people probably hear this and say, well, what can I do? And uh, what I would suggest that the, the, the people who prevented this, in uh, in uh, last decade are still around. You can still donate to them, and I'd encourage you to do so. It's called the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Well, and in fact, yes, all everyone listening, the EFF.org. Sorry to interrupt you, Leo, but... Uh, <laughs> no, no, go with it. Run with it. EFF.org is on top of this. There's four links on their home site right now. That and that, and that, Koika, uh, Koika, or whatever it's called, too. Yes, the other, yeah. the other, the, the earlier thing we talked DRM about. Issue. Yep. Yes, the, the, the using DNS blacklists, yep. government mandated. Both of those issues, they're on top of. And they've got some forms that allow you to write to your senator. And, I mean, I'm absolutely... I mean, this is somewhere where voices need to be heard. I'm delighted that that people who are who whose jobs and livelihoods are are fighting against this kind of problem. Again, I I want to be so clear. I mean, I've I've I have friends in the FBI years ago who you know back when we were all doing all the denial of service stuff and so forth. I mean, when we've had lunch and and we've talked about. This problem, I comp I'm so sympathetic to to the problem that there had that there's this fundamental problem with their ability to surveil traffic on the internet. But you know, there are problems that don't have good solutions. This doesn't have a good solution. And if a point-to-point -point encryption is outlawed, um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, the, uh, I guess. the EFF quotes the uh, 1999 um, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision in uh, the Bernstein case that says, whether we are surveilled by our government, by criminals, or by our neighbors, it is fa fair to say that never has our ability to shield our affairs from prying eyes been in such a low ebb. Low ebb. The availability and use of secure encryption may offer an opportunity to reclaim some portion of the privacy we have lost. This is the court writing. Government efforts to control encryption thus may well implicate not only the First Amendment rights of cryptographers intent on pushing the boundaries of their science, but also the constitutional rights of each of us as potential recipients of encryption's bounty. That's the court, folks. Yeah, and, and you know, one other point uh, that I've heard made that I think is a very good one, is that law enforcement is complaining about the rise of the internet, but a lot of communications is not encrypted. I mean, these dumb criminals are dumb, and they write email, and you know, and they use unencrypted technology. And the fact is, 
mean, the truth is that the FBI is having a field day with with tapping into unencrypted communications, um, w w which bad guys are using right now. Yes, encryption is a problem, but the fact that there's also still a preponderance of non-encryption and that it's over the internet and that you don't know when you're being right. when, 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 when you're being tapped means that in fact there's a, there's you know a huge amount of, of useful information that is doubtless being filtered through right now as we speak. Yeah, I guess if a crook's dumb enough, <laughs> they're going to be not going to be encrypting. If they're smart enough to use encryption of any kind, they're going to use strong encryption. So maybe that that dumb crook analogy doesn't work. I donate monthly. I'm a sustaining uh, donor to EFF. I encourage everybody to do that. EFF.org. They use the money to go to court. Not yes, only to raise they, awareness, but they go to court. They file amicus briefs. They challenge. They uh, they are court focused, and that's what makes them so effective. This and is, they they defended Dan Bernstein in right. his yes in his suit against the federal government. They saying, won that case. Yes. Uh, so you know we owe them for that in 1999. And if you want to continue to fight, I think the EFF is a great place to do so. They also, as you said, they have emails and stuff you can send, but. EFF.org. I think, it, you know, take that indignation and uh, put it to good use. Steve, I'm glad yeah. you raised this issue. I think it's, a, it's so important. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm stalled at this point. I mean, I have other stuff I have to get to before I start writing CryptoLink. The, the architecture is in place. The technology is in place. It's just, well, it's remember, just... it's not law yet. Attempts to make this law in the past have failed. I'd go ahead, Steve. Have faith. I don't have any. <laughs> the good will prevail. <laughs> I I can spend some time on spin right. That'll make lots of people happy. This is going to happen probably early next year. So you know, here we are toward the end of September. So you know, it's only a few months. Besides, I still have some other stuff I got to get to before I was going to start anyway. So I mean, I'm one thing. I like. I mean, if literally, if this if this shuts down, if this forecloses the ability to point to point communication, it's not going to happen. I, 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 We're well, fight it. We gotta fight it. We gotta well, fight it. Well, believe me, I, I'm ready for a fight. But Web, Web I, I am glad that I didn't already invest two years in CryptoLink and to and then have this happen. And it's like, oh, this isn't gonna happen. Web fifty five seventeen says politicians always win in the end. That's wrong. The people always win in the end. Politicians might win in the short term, but we always win in the end. We will win in this one. EFF.org. If, if, if people care, if well, people care, well, that's our job. Yeah, and you and everybody who's listening, job as a as a good geek, you know this is where your ability and your knowledge of this stuff comes into play. You can't sit on your butt, uh, you know. T take some time off from World of Warcraft and get out there and raise raise awareness, write some emails, and uh, and make it happen. Yeah, go to eff.org and and they they provide some forms that make it easy for you to send notes to your Absolutely. congressmen and senators, Absolutely. your representatives in yep. Washington. And now's the time. Yep. This we need to stop this. Steve Gibson. I mean, again, the... I, I, I again I I'm I'm sorry. The FBI is dealing with encryption. It is a horrible horrible problem. But it's math and it exists. And there 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 just isn't a way around it. Right. We now have the ability. To encrypt. I mean, what's next? True crypt on people's hard drives. There's gonna, you know, gonna force a backdoor for true crypt so that they can decrypt on demand. I mean, this is this is. We can't let this erosion happen. I couldn't agree more. Steve is at grc.com. That's where he lives. The Gibson Research Corporation. That's where you find Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. You'll also find every issue of this show, all 268 episodes both in 64 kilobit, the high quality audio, as well as 16 kilobit audio. He has transcripts uh, up there of each and every show as well for those of you who like to read along while you listen. And we provide audio and video at our site, twit.tv slash sn for security now. Twit.tv slash sn. And uh, when you're there, you can subscribe on iTunes, the Zoom Marketplace, whatever aggregator you use will work with that. Um, and YouTube and, and all the other places. Steve. And next week, we've got a Q&A. Good. So how do so, they how do they ask questions? GRC.com slash feedback. That'll take you to a web page with a form. Send me what you're thinking about. We would love to hear reactions to this. And uh, and we will uh, we'll do that next week. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. We'll talk again next week on Security Now. Thanks, Leo. Security Now.